<laughs> oh, uh, this full moon is the super moon of the year. On this day, the moon is a uh, little over 18,000 miles closer to earth than any of the full moons through the year. So that means uh, moon's gravitational pull is working on you better than ever. Those of you who are trying to ward it off with umbrellas, <laughs> it doesn't matter, it works through the umbrella, don't worry, I'm just joking. <laughs> so, what is the significance that if the moon is closer, what's the big deal? The big deal is today, the tides are going to be bigger than any time ever in this year, in these twelve months. Because the moon is so close, the fluids of this earth will rise. If you do not know, I'm sure you know <laughs> Oh, somebody got enlightened at the back, okay <laughs> See, people came and sat in the front row thinking it'll happen to them, but it happened there. What can I do? <laughs> you know, those who stand last will stand fast, somebody said, okay. <laughs> but these people are standing last because there is a big tree. <laughs> About everything that can rise, will rise on this night. It's my wish and my blessing, you should not miss it, you must rise. When the ocean is rising, when millions of tons of water is wanting to go upward because of the gravitational pull of the moon, do you believe that the fluids in your body will not rise? When I say fluids, it's not just about blood. Almost everything in this body, the mechanics of this body, the nutrition of this body, the various experiences of this body are controlled by secretions of glands. So when the moon is this close and it's full, all of them rise. If you keep yourself in the right attitude, the right things will rise. On this night, if you're in anger, misery, resentment, that will rise, what can I do? It's not me, it's the moon, you know <laughs> But if you remain in meditativeness, joy, peacefulness, love, that will rise. That's why the satsang, so that at least for this couple of hours, you stay well and the right things rise within you because this is all life is about. What kind of things arise within you? What kind of things reach the peak within you? Is it going to be your anger, frustration, resent resentment or joy, bliss, love? What is going to rise within you? This is all the quality of the human life is decided by. Everything that you are is just this, what is arising within you? So, uh, it's okay, this is what enlightenment means. <laughs> it always happens with a bang, huh? <laughs> Those of you who are holding uh, umbrellas with steel, uh, metal, Rods, please keep it down. Everybody, those who are holding umbrellas with metal sticks, please keep them down, it's all right if you get wet. You're well grounded, you're, uh, you know, you're well earthed, so even if lightning strikes you, it'll only pass through you. Really <laughs> Don't insulate yourself from the earth, then it stays with you. So, 
If somebody is feeling very nervous about it, you can move somewhere else, but you don't have to. A human being is a combination of various forms of compulsions and consciousness. Compulsions are of survival instincts, reproductive instincts which represent the survival of the race, psychological and emotional survival, social and financial survival, and if you have invented other kinds, other kinds. All of them put together occupy a lifetime for a whole lot of people. Most human beings may never even become or come anywhere close to being conscious. Not because it's far away, not because consciousness is a difficult thing, it is just that though it is the most vital aspect of your existence, you don't see it. If you're not conscious, you won't feel it. It's just like air, you don't see it. If you're not conscious, you don't even know that you're breathing. How many human beings on this planet, in twenty-four hours time, at least for five, ten minutes, they're conscious that they're breathing, unless they're asthmatic. Unless there is some difficulty in breathing, they won't notice it. Though it is most vital, if you stop it for two minutes, you're gone, but still, no. Consciousness is even more vital than the air that you breathe. It is even wrong to talk or refer to consciousness as it, because it's you. It's not something other than you. Well, it's not your body, it's not your thought process, it's not your emotion, it's not the arrangements that you've made, it's you, per se, this one. Because it is the most obvious, at the same time seems to be more… most elusive. It is not elusive, it's just that if you're looking east, you don't see west. If you're looking west, you don't see east. That's as simple as that, because you're looking in a different direction. Your time and energy is invested in a different direction. It looks like it's far away. More people are getting enlightened. I wish the flashes were going from here up. <clears throat> Coming. <laughs> so, uh, A guru arises because most people are not seeing what is not only right in front of their eyes, but also what is within their eyes, they cannot see. Simply because they're invested completely in a different direction. As I said, various levels of survival which is further complicated by social processes where people are immersed in their survival process forever and ever. They are uh, many ways dying to live. Most human beings are just dying to live. No, you must live and die one day. You shouldn't be dying to live. But if you're always panting about your survival process, what will happen to me? How will I be? Will I be better than somebody or not? Then your whole life goes in survival process. Well, survival is important. 
I am not saying you should not take care of it, only if you survive, all the other possibilities arise. But survival does not mean being better than somebody. Survival means you keep this life good, that doesn't take much, believe me. It's only when you want to be better than somebody, then it takes a whole lifetime. So a guru is not here to weave a philosophy or to start a new religion. <laughs> Spiritual process means life and deeper life. A guru is like a doorway. If you look at a doorway from a distance and you want to go there, actually the intent is to go through it, but from a distance the doorway itself is the destination. So if you're far away, guru is your destination. Like you know, I don't know, probably most nations don't have this in India, there is a gateway of India. Not everybody enters to that gate, don't misunderstand. <laughs> Not everybody who goes into India enters through the gate, it's a monument, it's a gateway. So, uh, if that was the only entry, if I want to go to India, I will look at the gateway as my destination. So in that sense, Guru is a destination. It is not about being far in terms of physical terms. It is not distance in miles and kilometers. It is if you're invested in something, you're far away. Invested in your dream world of social, psychological, emotional worlds, then the guru's work is to get to the creator's world, get you to the creator's world. Because you started creating your own world, you are like Vishwamitra. You started creating your own world in your mind and start living there. The guru's work is to get you to creator's world or if you don't understand that way, God's own world. So what should I do to get to the creator's world? You don't have to do anything, you're already there, you just have to settle in a bit. You must learn to breathe consciously, you must heart sh your heart should beat consciously. You must… every pulsation in the body must happen consciously. Above all, consciousness, which is the source of who you are, should become the front end of your life. Right now, till you are twenty-five, thirty, probably your body is the front end of your life. That is why everybody, you know, like especially in America, this is a habit. People come and tell me, Sadhguru, I did this, this. I said, why? Why did you do something so stupid? Say, ah, Sadhguru, I was only eighteen. <laughs> oh, I didn't know at eighteen you are supposed to be stupid and slowly you get smarter and just before you die you are really smart. That's dumb, believe me. You must get smart early, <laughs> it's very important. So, this is simply because you get invested in things that you create. Ah, being involved with life is not the problem, but when I say invested, you're getting identified with things that you create. Once you're identified with things that you create, then the whole fantastic creation that is here, for which there is no comparison anywhere because there is no anywhere else, this is it. But you will miss it completely because your thoughts, your emotions, your ideas, your philosophies, your belief systems or your phone screen <laughs> will keep you busy. You will never see reality for what it is. 
So, uh, a guru's job is mundane, very mundane, to make you see what is always there. It's not like suddenly a shooting star happened, look, 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 not like that. It's always there. Why the idiots don't see? That's a big question. Why is it that they don't see what is always there? Well, uh, you know, there is a history to this, you're not the only one, there's a history to this. You are having a certain, you know, illustrious, pe illustrious pedigree for ignorance. Because, you know, uh, it happened in Mahabharat, this Arjuna asked Krishna, what is the nature of this truth that you're talking about? Where is it? Is it here? Is it there? Where is it? So Krishna laughs and says, in a battlefield, he laughs and says, the ultimate truth about your life is at the tip of your nose. So now whole lot of people <laughs> started focusing on the tip of their noses, and uh, if you focus on the tip of your nose, within three minutes you'll get a severe headache. <laughs> if you're Chinese or Japanese or Vietnamese, you'll get it within one minute. He is telling you it is the most obvious thing. He is not saying truth is sitting on your nose. It is the most obvious thing, it's right here. If it was there, we could have run after that. We have raced, we could have raced in that direction and found it. But it's right here, always, inside, outside, same thing. So pointing this out, Though it is so simple, people make it so complex. <sighs> well, uh, there is also a tradition of people, see dead gurus are good gurus. Hello? Yes or no? Because if you find a dead guru, you can twist him, turn him, you can make him the way you want, really nice, sweet. Not only that, you can paint pictures of him walking upon water, flying in the air, astral travel in the clouds. It happens over… Uh, it just takes two hundred to three hundred years. By then, all kinds of miracles start happening. But I'm telling you, I'm very ordinary guru, very ordinary being. And always conscious to make sure nobody ever perceives me as special. That means little more ordinary than most people, always conscious to be like that. Because of this, some people may think I'm extraordinary, but that's their way of looking at it. But I'm very ordinary, more ordinary than most people, never trying to be special. Why I am telling this to you is, trying to be special, acting special means somehow creator has made a mistake with you. You have to add to extra. You have to… you heard that, please, they're asking for volume. You have to add something extra, at least a halo. Do I have one? Hello? <laughs> They've not added today, you know. Something extra, you don't need anything extra. Life has come full-fledged, absolutely full-fledged. 
every life. When it comes to physical prowess, what one person does, another person may, may not be able to do. When it comes to intellectual capabilities, what one person does, another person may not be able to do. But when it comes to the life process, everyone has come full-fledged. If you are talking about spiritual process, everybody has come with the same possibility. It is just that some may be little better oriented, because of that they may find results a little more quick or it may be just this. Some people are trying to learn from the guru. They can go on learning, it'll take lifetimes. As I've already said, in this lifetime, if I live long enough and do my best, that best means seven days of the week and da-da-da. If I do all that, probably I will share two percent of what I have perceived. If I do two percent, it must be great. So if you learn, it's a long process. Some come closer and they just embrace the guru. Because of that, they have pleasantness of experience. They live joyfully and blissfully, no matter what is happening in the physical situations in their life, because they have touched grace. But another way, somebody comes and dissolves into it because a uh, little deeper guru is like acid. Yes, always on acid, you can see. So you can just dissolve in it. If your heart beats for your guru, or your breath feels like your guru, or your guru feels like your liberation, this is all left to you. You can be... a guru can be your breath, your heartbeat, or your liberation, it's your choice. Certain things you can enjoy, certain things, the nature of it is such, you become part of something else. There is nobody to enjoy, but it's... it's like that. So how to approach a guru? As I said, you can learn to bow down from a distance. You can learn, you can embrace or you can dissolve. Today is Guru Purnima, it's your choice. Whatever choice you make, I am with you. I am not insisting this way or that way. As I said, I am not here <laughs> to weave philosophies, create new ideologies, create a new religion, no. Create a strong, atmosphere before I leave, create uh, huge spaces of acid <laughs> where people can come and dissolve and become a part of it. I know acid is a negative word, I can say a solvent <laughs> but you know, I'm a little committed to using negative terminology always, because uh, if I say positive terminology, if I use positive terminology, people let their hallucinations run away. Because people from their early childhood, in most cultures they've been fed on heaven and angels and fantastic things, if a guru comes or a saint or a sage comes, he will always walk in the air, never on the ground and incredible things. I've also told you about a sage who doesn't shit. <laughs> so, uh, nothing like that, just ordinary, very ordinary. 
more ordinary than most people. In fact, during the Save Soil movement, I went on telling everybody, many leaders, they were all surprised, ministers and, uh, you know, agriculture and uh, environment ministers, officials, when they asked me, Sadhguru, how, how do you know this, how do you know that, what to do? I said, see, I'm just a worm, I can't intellectualize everything, but I can tell you this is how it works because I'm a worm. Usually you call somebody a worm when you think they are the lowest of the lowest creatures. But actually, when you call somebody a worm, you're elevating them to a space and saying, you're the foundation of my life. You don't know that, you think they are low, but you're actually acknowledging that you are the foundation of my life. Uh, in twenty-first century, what is the advantage of being enlightened? <laughs> this happened, this could be my great-grandmother. A hundred and eight-year-old woman was asked, what is the best thing about being one not eight? She said, no peer pressure <laughs> No peer pressure. So the way to handle your dreams, if you don't learn to handle your dreams like a play, lightly, if you get identified and invested in the dreams as if they are reality, for those of you all over the world, I'm, suppose you are in the middle of the night and you think I'm talking about the dreams that you are having, no, I'm talking about everything that you think. Your psychological and emotional process is a dream. This may be a little not so nice to say, but it's Guru Purnima, it's my day. I can say what I want. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> so, uh, suppose you go and tell somebody genuinely, you're in high school and you went and said, I love you, that's a dream. Actually, in India, when you say that, people will say that is moha. Moha means it's a dream, it's an illusion. Because you are making it up in your mind. Now your emotions get linked to the thought process and boom, it becomes more real than the whole universe. Yes or no? Hello? You remember that girl? Hello? You remember that girl in high school? She was more real than the cosmos, isn't it? <laughs> That's called moha. <laughs> that means your mind is conjuring up illusions to take you away somewhere. It has its own purpose, let me not go into that. Essentially, nature wants you to do certain things because it has its own purpose, it's worked so hard through the evolutionary process from a single-celled animal to make such a complex life, it doesn't want all of you to get enlightened and simply sit like this and be fantastic. <laughs> it wants you to go through the process and the works and uh, you know. <laughs> the next layer of people must come. <laughs> So it has its own purpose, so suddenly it makes, uh, you know, in India there are names like this for woman, Chandramukhi, that means she's like a moon. If somebody has to have a face like a moon, she must be really <laughs> Well, anyway, it doesn't matter, but essentially we are trying to say she's more beautiful than the moon. And she will look much more beautiful than the moon and anything in the universe because nature has a way to handle you and manage your dreams in such a way 
to make you absolutely believe this is it at that moment. Some of you get enlightened soon, either because of the other person <laughs> or sometimes by yourself if you're wise <laughs> or sometimes it runs for many years and then you understand slowly or even there on your deathbed you're holding somebody's hand and thinking this is it. But you must understand nobody's coming with you, just you going <laughs> So I'm not trying to belittle people's love, their longings for each other, it's fine. But I'm saying, you must play these things little light. Only then, you will have the needed energy to explore what is the core of your life. Is it wrong to do this, this and that which we are right now considering as life? There's nothing else such as right and wrong there, it's perfectly fine. You can do all those things, but you shouldn't get lost in your dream, isn't it? See, the problem is you may get lost in your dream and the worst thing is you may find your way in the dream. If you find your way in your dream, you really got lost, isn't it? This happened. This happened. One morning, a young woman got up in the morning and said to her husband, John, you know what? I had a dream tonight. Really, baby, what was the dream? You know, in my dream, on my birthday, you gave me a pearl necklace. What do you think about this? He said, well, your birthday is just day after tomorrow. You just wait, you will know what it means. <laughs> then she was waiting for the evening when he comes back. And lo, he came with a nicely packaged box and he gave it to her. She opened it, all the ribbons and stuff, rup, 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 ripped it open and looked. There, there was a book, Meaning of Dreams <laughs> So, uh, because there is so much all kinds of, you know, today it is like this, I'm seeing a lot of people even around me are doing this. They've all become, they're paranoid about their health. They're all doing medical research. You bring any doctor to them, they won't agree because they've read this, this, that in the internet. If <laughs> we are having some trouble with people, you send them to the best doctor. The doctor says, see, this is the problem. So no, 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 in the internet I read it is this, 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 is this. I have the most bizarre disease that you do not understand <laughs> So these internet doctors, just like that, there are spiritual gurus everywhere, you also playing that little bit, you know. All of you also doing it a little bit. Because this whole jargon that's gone on for centuries or millennia, all kinds of terms all over the place, everybody using all kinds of things. So one important thing is you must remove all the impurities from your life, you must become pure. How? <laughs> well, last two years you've been dipping yourself in alcohol. In Tennessee here, people have been doing this inside out for many years. <laughs> but uh, even uh, teetotalers as they used to be known, people who never drank alcohol, even all those people have been dipping themselves in alcohol while last two years because of this pandemic or whatever. So how to remove all the impurities and become pure? Get rid of your hatred, get rid of your resentment, get rid of your fear. Oh, try and see please. 
<laughs> if you try for a million lifetimes, they're not going to go because they don't exist. You make them up. You make them up. After some time, it might have become a habit. See, you can just try this. Next three days, all of you, and just do. Hmm? Okay, every five minutes you just do this. You will see on the fourth day you don't have to do it, it just starts happening. <laughs> because the body and the structure of the mind and body has a way of learning and doing their own things after some time. These days all athletes and others are, you know, making, uh, highlighting it as muscle memory. You may have some muscle in your brain also, you know, it can happen. Is it too rainy for all of you? You must show them how they're sitting in this rain. The world should see the wonderful people getting soaked in the rain Then the customer opened the packet. Then Shankaran Pillai said, Sir, one of them was rotten, so instead of you taking the trouble of trashing it, I did it myself <laughs> So, <laughs> these are all tricks. <laughs> that have never worked, but they continue to be used forever. No, you don't try to become free of anger, free of resentment, free of frustration, no. If you light this up, if you energize this, it'll overflow with a different quality, which will… the flood will wash away everything. Instead of trying to get rid of this and that because that never works, because it doesn't exist. Are you angry right now? Then how to get rid of it? Are you resentful right now? How to get rid of it? Not when the thunder went off, but right now are you fearful? <laughs> then how to get rid of it? How to get rid of something which is not there? Whatever habitual experiences you have, it's because you have invested certain time and energy, so it's happened. If you… if you find something more spectacular, will all the small things in your life drop off by itself? That's all you have to do. This is what I'm talking about as consciousness. 
if you find that, all the other small things of your attractions to food, drink and it's not that you cannot enjoy it, but they will not be big deal, they are there. But once you find something more spectacular, all the other things will just go away. So that is where your investment should be, to see that you touch it now in this life, not some other time. In this life it needs to happen. Uh, I promise that I will take some questions but uh, we just have uh, maybe thirty minutes, please let's do that. First preference with the online people, okay, they are not… they are not even getting wet, they are missing the whole scene. <laughs> so, Prakash from Mumbai asks, when I have nothing to do, what is the best way to kill time <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad all of you got it <laughs> Oh, <laughs> I didn't know people in Mumbai had nothing to do. <laughs> They're usually busy bodies <laughs> Well, uh, you are going to kill time. No, time is killing you every moment <laughs> It is time which kills you, not about you ever killing time <laughs> Now uh, you're in Mumbai and you know the whole controversy right now going on about Kali. I know the controversy is of political nature, but now that Kali is in picture, let me tell you what Kali means. Kali means she's time. All those skulls around her neck, uh, I want you to understand the present uh, imagery of Kali, of being fierce and the queen of the battles and chopping off demons' heads and all this, is only approximately fourteen to fifteen hundred years old. But Kali worship has been there for many, many millennia. So these are more recent images and in the last two, three centuries she has become more of a benevolent mother and all these things. I think these are all external influences which have happened, but essentially Kali means time. Ultimately your skull also will hang on her mala one day. <laughs> Hello? Because she is time, she is Mahakali and because of that, Time is always dancing away, never stopping, isn't it? You can stop your watch if you want, but time won't stop. Only Americans have the habit of turning one hour forward, backward once a year <laughs> Otherwise it's always running away. Once it… once I did time travel, say I am not an ordinary man, Oh, worldwide they're waiting, the guru will say something wise but I'm fooling around <laughs> because that is the wisdom of life that you don't get so bloody serious about your existence, fool around a little bit, huh? <laughs> No, no, the boys are understanding fooling around differently <laughs> I'm not talking about that, with yourself. Make a fool of yourself because you are a bloody fool. You're sitting on this tiny little mud ball which you call as planet Earth in the middle of nowhere and how many things you think about yourself and how significant you become when you're just a speck both in terms of space and time, 
you occupy just a speck of this cosmos. So Kali represents both time and space. The word Kali means… Kala means time, Kala also means emptiness or Kali also means emptiness or space. So there is only one term in yoga for both time and space because we don't see it differently. It's modern intellect which is trying to see it like this. Because there is space, because there is point A and point B, it takes time to travel this distance. Why don't you see it this way? Because there is time, there is a possibility of point A and point B. I'm saying you can go on doing chicken and egg business with it. So we don't see it as different. You can go on arguing which is first, time first or space first, chicken first or egg first. This has been going on. The wisdom of life is like this. One day, Shankaran Pillai, it was a reunion of their college people after many years, fifteen, twenty years later. So they all went to a big restaurant where all the friends were, you know, when they reunion, they have to speak loudly. Hello? <laughs> Because uh, within ten minutes, half of them will be nearly drunk. You have to speak very loudly to get your so-called friends that you don't see each other for fifteen years, but you're best of friends, all right <laughs> So others were busy talking and drinking. And uh, Shankaran Pillai, everybody ordered all kinds of food. Shankaran Pillai just waiting for the food, he's hungry. He's not in interested in the conversation because he knows when he was in college also they spoke no sense. Now, <laughs> nonsense matures <laughs> Yes <laughs> See, uh, you listen to your teenage children, they're, kuchu 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 kuchu, they're going. You think, what nonsense are they talking like this non-stop? But they listen to your conversations and say, this is dumb nonsense <laughs> Because they see their nonsense has matured, nothing really big change happened. Same thing, taking on different forms. So, uh, Shankaran Pillai just sat there waiting for food. Then this debate came off, is chicken first or egg first? Big argument happening among all these people, almost fighting over it. Then uh, somebody poked Shankaran Pillai in the rib. Hey, what is this? You're just sitting there. What do you think? Does chicken come first or egg come first? Shankaran Pillai looked like this and said, whichever they ordered first will come <laughs> So, uh, Mr. Prakash, <laughs> Cha Kali, Time is killing you, don't ever think you can kill time. What you are saying is, there is nothing you can do about time. You cannot use time, you cannot kill time. You can make use of yourself or you can kill yourself, this you can do. Please. Little louder for all of them, please. Sadhguru, last year you went for the North American journey. This year you went on the safe soil journey. I saw a video in which you were talking about how yogis traveled across the world and laid many spiritual eggs in many places. So, would, <laughs> so would you also Apart from the social aspects of the work, are you also doing some mystical work? Well, no, no, because just now we said the chicken and egg stuff, these guys are thinking… <laughs> these guys are thinking Mark is talking about those eggs, he's not talking about those eggs. An egg means today, 
Unfortunately, here in United States, you think breakfast <laughs> An egg means a potential bird. Hello? Yes or no? It is just like, suppose you go into a cannibal society or a tribe, they look at you and say, ah, this little one for breakfast, this one for lunch, that one for dinner. Hello? That doesn't make, mean that you become breakfast, lunch, dinner. Unfortunately, you become if you're in the wrong place. So similarly, unfortunately for these birds, if you say egg, everybody thinks breakfast. Well done or rare or sunny side <laughs> or poach it or boil it or whatever, nobody is thinking of an egg means a bird, a possible bird. Hello? Living thing. Now, now somebody will be arguing, no, no, Chicken eggs we eat are not fertilized, I know all that, but why didn't you allow them to fertilize? Because you caged them up. <laughs> Leave that part. So, Mark is talking about other kinds of eggs. That means you invest. Egg means essentially it is held. It's a potential life held in a case that will come out at a certain time. When you look at egg, you can't believe this can grow feathers and fly one day, hello? Doesn't look like that, it looks aerodynamic, it can go like a jet maybe, but it can't fly like this. <laughs> but what comes out of it will grow feathers and everything will happen. Next time you eat your egg, you must see the bird. Yes. A little bird, tiny little bird trying to come out of those liquids. Uh, no, nothing wrong, you must see the reality and then you will eat with some reverence, you know. Right now you're just thinking it's food. No, no, it's life. Unfortunately, we have to eat it. So at least a uh, little. So Mark, California, you know, he's not talking about chicken eggs or any kind of egg. He's talking about mystical eggs means you drop something somewhere so that it'll hatch later in future. There are many, many places like that where potential spiritual stuff is dropped because in their own lifetime, they don't find enough people who are receptive, they leave it for future. Somebody will stumble upon it, somebody who had the necessary seeking and the quality will make use of it. India is full of such places. We found some places like that in United States. Though too many changes have been made, but still potentially alive. So now he's asking, did I lay my eggs and come? <laughs> See, Whatever the nature of your existence, wherever you go, for whatever purpose you go, the fundamental nature of your existence will not go, it will anyway be there. So you will see some parts of North America and some parts of Europe and even Arabia, you will see things will hatch in the next one or two years. You will see it for sure. Mm -hmm. Questions? Yep. Mm -hmm. Where are you? Yep. You got it <laughs> Well, for those of you who don't understand, when he just asked why there's no Guru Amavasya, lights went off. <laughs> B 
He gave you a taste of Guru Amavasya, you won't say anything, okay? <laughs> Why is a guru associated with Pavnami? This Pavnami, as I've said many times before, is the day when Adiyogi, who was a yogi, was kind of compelled to become a guru. So he chose an appropriate day. If you want to sit outside in open skies and talk to people, would you choose a Pārnami or an Amavasya? Please tell me. Naturally, isn't it? That's not the only reason. It is also, as I already said, the gravitational pull is such that people are more perceptive on that day. Amavasya is just the reverse of that. So is Amavasya bad? No, it is very good for certain purposes. But not to make you sit outside like this and talk to you in open air, then Pavnami is good. And above all, it is the first Pavnami of what we call as sadhana pada, that is after summer solstice, this is the first Pavnami or the full moon. So it is at summer solstice time, because of the shift that is happening in the planetary quality, a yogi always little rejigs himself. All life rejigs itself, even your own body does it, whether you will notice it or not is the only question. But when you pass through solstice, the body will make a little adjustment to… to flourish well in the new conditions that are happening. Because the way the planet is influenced by the sun and various other planets shifts and changes twice a year, what is referred to as summer solstice and winter solstice. And uh, on that day when he's making those changes, he suddenly noticed these seven people are still waiting after many, many years. Suppose I close my eyes and I'm meditating. I went away for many hours. If I open my eyes, if you're still here, then you won't be here, is it? That's good <laughs> Even there only seven people waited. So, uh, when he made those adjustments within himself, he came out of what he was and then he saw still they were waiting. That year, the solstice day and uh, the full moon were on the same day as it was uh, a year or two years ago. So, he decided, they have been waiting for many years without him uttering a word or showing any interest in them. Still they are waiting. That means they have realized the possibility. They are not going to leave because they have realized the possibility. They have not come for entertainment. They know what is waiting for them. So he decided, okay, and he turned into a guru. And the first guru, Adi Yogi become the Adi Guru on this night. So it happened to be a Pārnami and isn't it wonderful? And also, the way the tradition organized itself is, in sadhana pada, that is from here onwards, all the amavasyas are important because you're doing sadhana. In kaivalya pada, where blossoming, blossoming is supposed to happen, all Pārnamis are important. There is taipusam, there is a Buddha Pārnami, there is Guru Pārnami, there are many important Pārnamis in that part, which is the northern run of the sun. In the southern run, this is important because sun is in the wrong place. Wrong is not the word, sun is in another place. So the moon being in a counter place, that becomes important. So, I mean, you, you have to look at the geometry of this, how it works you will see there is some sense to this and there is some value to this. 
because this is how life responds, not just you, all life responds this way. So, Parnami is not only for the guru, it is for blossoming. So all Guru Purnima, Buddha Purnima, uh, Dhanya Purnima, all these are suggesting enlightenment. Buddha Purnima means the day Buddha got enlightened. Dhanya Purnami is a day many, many sages and seers got enlightened on that day or they left on that day, they any number. So Purnami nights, these things happen more easily. So Purnami is seen as the day of blossoming. Amavasya is seen as the day of hard work to do about yourself. So, Guru Purnima, Guru Amavasya is not there, that means the Guru will… Guru means… Gu means darkness, Ru means dispeller. So, Parna means better, hello <laughs> Amavasya is the darkest day, all right? Please. Yes, yes, please take the microphone. Namaskaram Sadhguru. Where are you? On my left, on your left. Yep. Sadhguru, I feel very close to you, yet at the same time, I feel very far away from you. <laughs> Why is that so? Where do you live? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> You got fans out here ah, for that question. I hope the question got across to everybody else who are very far away. The question is, I feel very close to you and at the same time I feel very far, far away from you. How do I stay close? So closeness and distance are not of physical distances, not measurable distances as such. See, Right now I am sitting here as a person, but you are not here for the person. You don't have to come and sit soaked in this rain to see a person. What is the point? There are so many people everywhere. So there are two aspects to yourself. One is your being, that is who you really are. Another is your body, your thought, your emotion, your social arrangements, whole lot of accessories. When you get invested in your accessories, you feel far away because I seem to be nowhere in sight. If you simply sit, you know, as a being, I will be right there with you, no question. Because when it comes to the being, there is no such thing as this being and that being. There is just one being. There is this person and that person. There is this body and that body. There is this mind and that mind. There is this nonsense and that nonsense. But there is only one being. You captured a little and you think it's yours. The moment you think it's yours, you don't have it. So those moments when you're meditative, those moments when you feel love, those moments when you're very joyful, you feel Sadhguru is right here. Those moments when you're doing Sadhguru seems to be in another world, where the hell is he? Why is he not helping me? I got financial problems <laughs> No, not always in America, it's not always financial problems. My girlfriend is uh, doped and she's going away <laughs> Why is Sadhguru not doing something? So, uh, 
you just have to move towards your being. I'm saying your being, it's a misnomer to call it your being. You must become more of a being, then you will see the light and the guidance that you refer to as Sadhguru is there every moment of your life. You're invested in something else, your dreams. Well, you know I'm not a part of your dream <laughs> and, and I need not be. Your dreams you play, once you're invested there, you're looking in a different direction. Once you're looking in a different direction, it looks far away. See, right now you're looking this way, I'm right here. If you turn around, where am I? Oh, you have to go across the world and come back. <laughs> That's how far it is. So your experience of being close and far away is just this. When you look this way, I'm right here. When you look that way, I am… you have to circumnavigate the whole planet. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Please, microphone. Maintain some gender parity. Yeah, the ladies are grabbing the microphone all the time. Namaskar and Sadhguruji. <laughs> <laughs> Could you dance no, with I'm us? I'm just reminding the ladies, it's only a microphone, it's not a phone. Please tell me. Could you dance with us tonight? Oh, can we not? sing a song together that everyone can sing? Let's get some rain going, all right, <laughs> to dance. Namaskaram Sadhguru. Mm -hmm. After your hundred-day journey through Europe, Middle East and… A louder, in... please hold the microphone a little closer. After your hundred-day journey through Europe, Middle East and India for safe soil, what are your plans for United States and Canada and how can Earth Buddies here support your goal? No, no, no. No, when you say I'm an Earth Buddy, why are you saying United States and Canada? You're an Earth Buddy. Hello? An earth buddy means somewhere we understand this is beyond nationalities. So if you're an earth buddy, where, what does it matter where you are? As I have told you, right now, uh, just after this, after this couple of weeks, I am in two countries in South America and maybe three or four countries in Caribbean and then in Europe. All these nations are uh, seriously looking at how to take the safe soil forward and these are small nations who don't have a great amount of scientific, uh, you know, uh, capabilities. So we are in the process of forming a, at least a twenty to twenty-five member committee who can technically support these nations and uh, some of these nations at that time, last trip that I was there, they even offered that they are willing to give us one island four or five square miles where uh, we can demonstrate how different crops that matter to their nations can be grown in a regenerative way without uh, destroying the soil. How can we do this? When I say regenerative way, I am not talking about very fanatical way of looking at it. Putting back organic content into the soil is the first aspect of regeneration. If it's your kitchen garden, you can talk about, I won't use any chemical, I won't use any fertilizer, you can do that. But if you're talking about feeding eight billion people, you don't talk like that. You raise the organic content, then the chemical usage will slowly start coming down. If you raise it significantly, it may come down in six to eight years, ten years' time. If you do it slowly, it may take twenty, twenty-five years' time. But nobody can dispute this as organic content rises in the soil, the chemical usage or the need for chemical usage will start slipping down. That's the way forward. 
if we want to do this without disrupting agriculture on the planet. Disruption means, just to give you a sense of it, suppose tomorrow we stop all fertilizers and chemicals and everything, totally, because you have a fanciful idea about it. World's food production will come down to maybe twenty-five percent of what it is. That's pure death. So let's not talk irresponsibly. It's important that we raise the organic content, necessary policies have to be made, necessary incentives have to be given. I'm talking to different crew groups of people, businesses, industry, variety of people to see if we can compensate these small nations. We want to pick one nation in Caribbean, one in Africa and one state in India at different latitudes and different soil types and demonstrate that this can be done effectively in three to four years' time. For this, so that the governments move quickly, if they move by themselves, it's great. Otherwise, we want to bring in private funding, which will at least compensate fifty percent of the incentive that goes to the farmer. If fifty percent is given by us, another fifty percent we can demand from the governments and get it off the shelf quickly. Otherwise, the problem is everybody is inclined towards it. I have no doubt the world will move in the direction of saving soil and the policy. It is just a question of pace. Will we do it now or will we do it tomorrow? Tomorrow is a dangerous place because it never comes. It will get postponed till major disasters happen. That's our human problem. We don't mitigate disasters. We wait for them to happen and then we cry and we make movies about it, we make drama about it, we lament about it. No, we must mitigate disasters. So if it has to happen, it has to happen in time. So we are looking at this also. If any of you are competent to do that, it's great. We need a strong team of people who can travel, who can do things uh, and make this happen in different governments. I can't be going to every nation in the world continuously like this because there are many things, but G20 is coming to India. India has the stewardship from December onwards for one year. So many of the meetings, we are included in this officially. Out of the 130 meetings that are happening in the country through the year, at least 25 to 30 important meetings, we are a part of it officially. So uh, we will affect that in this G20 <clears throat> All this needs backup power. Right now this is the problem, we have uh, projects coming up, we have spiritual processes, we are increasing the programs which uh, had stopped during the COVID time, now we're putting back the programs. There are spiritual events coming up, spiritual infrastructure being built. In all this, this soil is a huge thing. Many of you who have the necessary competence or we can train you for this, that uh, we need at least a team of fifty to hundred strong people around the world. If all of them come from North America, it's great. If we have hundred people who are willing to dedicate at least at least three to four hours a day and when they have to travel somewhere, they will have to travel. We will take care of the expenses for the travel, but we can't pay you salaries or anything. At least four hours a day, if you dedicate, we can make this happen, literally happen on the ground. But I need those people. All these coo coo cat calls, are they all coming or no? Or they're just cats who will escape. <laughs> you know, cats are never re reliable. At least you say, bow bow, I can believe you <laughs> Namaskaram. <Mr>. Namaskaram. <laughs> Sorry. Ladies first, I guess. Yes, yes. <laughs> Namaskaram Sadhguru, my name is Durgesh Nandini. I have a question. There are certain rituals which are important in Indian culture when a child is born. The first thing is we name him with a specific alphabet. Second thing is like after, during the sixth day, we say that his journey or his destiny is going to return. You know, we call it as Chetti Puja. So I wanted to know the significance of this. And how does his name and that particular day's puja impacts his journey? 
because when i take my name as durgesh nandini it empowers me and i want to know know the reality of it well uh, in india there are rituals and processes unfortunately many of them have become mere rituals rituals but if you look at them carefully there is certain profoundness to them most of them at least that the ritual starts with marriage there's a ritual for conception there's a ritual at different stages of pregnancy there's a ritual for delivery and every few days there are things when the child you know is breastfed there is a ritual when the child is eating solid food there's a ritual the child starts his education there's a ritual because a human child has come unformed you have not come like other creatures other creatures drop out of their mother's wombs and tuk tuk within 3 days they're running around but a human child has come largely unformed if you don't mold it properly that life will not become much molding is not just by giving nourishment through food nourishment in many different ways if we do this in a given society we will produce many great beings in the world for sure but it will take that level of dedication and commitment to a new life this is why i am telling young women if you are not committed if you want to do something else do that right now there is no dearth for human beings you don't have you don't bear children unless you are ready for putting your life into it for at least 18 20 years if that's not possible why simply because unless you can produce a life which is better than you you should not do it hello in some way at least the next generation should be one step ahead of you if you cannot do that it's not just in biology it is in the way you mold a child molding does not mean giving them morals values ethics no energetically you can mold the child for a higher possibility so this is what these rituals are i don't want to go into the detail right now quite a few of them are being performed in the devi temple in india we can also bring it here but we we need to train people those cats i want to catch those cats <laughs> because this needs committed very dedicated approach to train you for rituals of birth rituals of life and rituals of death we want to train people but where are they two days they will do and run here and there we can't do that because it needs a certain investment of energy and life to make these things happen if uh, there are cats here i told you cats are not reliable any time they'll walk away those bows i trust more because <laughs> we already been eulogizing dogs and puppies since yesterday <laughs> so if you are one of them please do this probably sometime next year we could start a training process that it could be done here we could also help you to set up shrines wherever you are and do it there because everybody cannot travel here it could be done anywhere only thing is we want absolute integrity this is the problem with the ritual once you are able to affect somebody's life in a certain way then it is very important you are of a certain level of integrity otherwise that becomes the source of exploitation this is what has happened traditionally rituals became so corrupt everything became commercial and in a certain way because of that people threw the baby out of the bath with the bath water they threw the rituals out because of the corruption that happened we should have thrown the corruption out and kept the process but unfortunately people cannot decipher what is what so this happens we can bring it back if you show me that you are people of such integrity even if i give you a tool where you can decide life and death of the person who is sitting in front of you you never ever will misuse it if you give me that confidence we can train you